Hello. Well, hi, Stephen. Great to see you. Um, I should say that the last time I dealt with an entrepreneur who was trying to run more than two companies at once, it was Elon Musk. Mm. Do you feel any kindred spirit? I mean, <laughs> it's a very flattering comparison. I think um, he's, he's clearly... Uh, He's got a different approach than I have, that's for sure. I, I tend to sleep a little bit more than I understand he sleeps. I've got significantly fewer children. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, see, that's not hard. I, I find the, the three children enough with two companies, so right. I don't know. I don't know how he does you don't, it. You don't send out mad tweets at, or X's at one o'clock in the morning every day? No tweets. Good, good, or X's. Right, well, um, so you clearly have two fascinating companies. One is Flying Taxis, which I'll come on to in a minute. Did you read a lot of sci-fi when you were a kid? I like st uh, Star Wars. Yeah. All right. But I wouldn't say more than most. All right. Well, Normal flying amount. taxis does sound like sci-fi, but you've also got the energy company, mm. um, and the energy company is obviously extremely relevant to what we're talking about today. Um, perhaps we can start with the Olive Stone um, video. Um, mm. Just last month, the Pentagon came out and essentially did the first ever. Um, contract with a company make, doing SMRs to power an air base up in Alaska. It's the first time it's happened, a really quite remarkable um, transaction. Um, do you believe in SMRs? I mean, would you go with the Pentagon as a, thinking that they could be a useful part of the energy mix in the future? I don't know enough about the economics. Uh, I like the idea of modularity. Uh, we were just hearing making multiple versions of the same thing. I think building custom Build gigawatt scale uh, power plants is very, very expensive. Uh, I think I'm more optimistic on, on solar, wind, and other renewables. I, they have their limitations. But when I look at the economics of building big nuclear programs, it feels like the costs are very high and they're uncertain. The biggest cost in the UK right now is uh, the energy sector is cleaning up mm -hmm. uh, the first generation of nuclear power plants. The, the, the cleanup costs for solar fields are enormous. Right. And so, this is something that future generations have to pay for, and the costs are uncertain. Now, right. there are lots of interesting technologies, um, and a lots of smart people work in this. Liquid thorium is a really interesting, novel nuclear technology, but this is two or three decades away, I think. Fusion, again, uh, we've got a great uh, fusion ecosystem here in the UK, and mm -hmm. startups doing nuclear fusion. I mean, you couldn't have heard of this 10 years ago. Yes. But again, two or three decades away. And if you look at the changes in the economics of solar, wind, uh, electric, uh, battery storage, there's not, I don't think there's any private capital that wants to invest in an energy future that's two decades out. Right. And so it's governments, military applications. There's a, there's a role for nuclear uh, military applications for a long time now, uh, aircraft carriers, submarines and so on. But that's not how we would power a civilian grid paid for by consumers. Right. So I think the question on nuclear is it's a really complicated one. I understand why some politicians and um, commentators will talk about hedging our bets. But mm -hmm. if you look at the direction of travel, uh, it, it's a very brave person that would be investing in a nuclear power plant on a commercial basis today. Right. OK, so going all in on renewables, mm. um, at least for the short to medium term, um, obviously a flood of money has gone into the space in the last couple of years. It's now hit two potential hiccups in the UK. One is the incredible fluctuations in supply. We had all those disasters of the wind not blowing last year, mm. and that certainly damaged the brand quite a bit. And then secondly, we have this little thing called the government doing a whole bunch of auctions recently for the offshore wind turbines mm. and not getting any bids at all. Why? I suspect the government were being a little greedy in terms of the, the, you always hear about this downward cost pressure on, on offshore wind in particular. And if you look back, the first tender, I think, was like for £145 per megawatt hour, guaranteed mm -hmm. inflation link for... 20 years and then two years later bids were winning at 50 and so you know a lot of people made a lot of money in the early years in offshore wind I suspect the pendulum swung too far the other way cost of steel the construction and all of these things of costs are going up and I suspect that you know we'll rerun the auction again in six months time and it'll be higher than before and that will be okay right how badly damaged has the industry been by the windfall tax I don't know. That's not really my department. Right. Um, we're very much at the consumer end. Right. Um, 
I think any changes in government policy, any ad hoc taxes, any, obviously investors love more than anything else is stability. Right. And predictability of earnings and any action that upsets that increases the cost of capital, increases the cost of renewal. So clearly there's been a damage, but ultimately, you know, if anybody's bidding on a, an offshore wind farm, they've got a 15, 20 year inflation <coughs> contract from the government, you know, I'm quite sure they will, they will go for it. Right. And if you look at countries all around the world, it's pretty clear the direction of travel is simple. And, and when we were setting up Ovo Energy, we had a really very simple mindset. And it was whatever technology makes possible that's best for consumers will happen sooner or later. Politics, media, regulation, taxation, all of this stuff may slow things down or speed things up, but ultimately the direction of travel is pretty clear. And all around the world, uh, renewables are falling in price still. And you see, I think it's Australia, few weeks ago, they had a, a settlement period where 70% of their energy was being generated, uh, I think, by solar, by right. renewables. That's an incredible transformation in 10 years. Yeah. Well, the Australians have a lot of sunshine. It's they not do. quite the same in the UK. But anyway, when in practical terms would you expect that your average British household will be able to know that they have completely phased out fossil fuels from their own energy mix? Well, I think speaking as a consumer champion, it's very dangerous to talk in averages. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of uh, households that are currently off a gas grid using oil-fired central heating. It's very expensive, very dirty. They will be the first to have a really strong economic case for electrification of heat. Um, but look, I, when I think about the energy, mix, we all talk about getting to net zero. And honestly, the last 5% will be the most expensive and most painful. Uh, I, I would urge policymakers and anybody thinking about business, let's reduce as much as we can, as cheaply as we can, without you know, dying on the altar of, of zero. Because the cheapest way to generate electricity in the UK right now would be to have an enormous amount of wind and solar, and then build a whole bunch of gas plants that we use when the wind's not blowing. That balance of intermittent renewables and backup gas generation that's the cheapest way to, to really uh, get to, not zero, but very close to zero. And then uh, a very good friend of mine, uh, he's building an amazing company, the, the synthetic aviation fuel, synthetic kerosene, and he has this very simple idea. Nature has given us these amazing hydrocarbon molecules. They're the perfect medium for energy storage. So why ignore them? Because now we can synthesize hydrocarbons with sunlight and fresh air and water. At the moment, it's expensive, but if you look at the cost curve and the, the falling cost for solar, for example, in the last 15 years, I would bet that the cheapest way we're going to generate hydrocarbons or, or, or use hydrocarbons in years to come will be synthetic hydrocarbons. They'll be cheaper than extracted. Okay, so your basic message is stay flexible and adapt as a technology develops. The thing that the UK government admitted to last week when they changed the policy on electric vehicles and, and heat pumps and so on was that in a democracy, people have to vote for it. And if you're taking uh, policy decisions that go 20, 30 years, but you get elected every five years, you have to bring people with you. Right. And so we have to deliver the energy transition at a price that society can afford. Right. And if you try to rush it, when the technology is not ready, supply chains aren't ready, it costs so much more than it does if you can be a little bit more patient. Right. So I would say take all the low hanging fruit we can get, yeah. Don't be stuck on the ideology of getting to zero immediately, yeah. but let's reduce our carbon intensity at the, at the most efficient way we can right. and, and, and provide incentives for the, the long-term investments that we right. need. Right. In the last couple of minutes, mm. let's quickly talk flying taxis. Yep. Why bother? Come on. <laughs> Come on. That's why I, I asked mean, you because you read sci-fi as a kid. Anyway. Well, not sci-fi, the Jetsons, let's say. Yeah. I remember reading a, a, a quote, I think it was Peter Thiel, uh, we're talking about the adaptation or the, the use of technology for societal good. And he said, we were promised flying cars. All we got was 140 characters. Mm. And this is, a, I just think this is, this is the future. We're talking about an incredible vehicle that passengers will be able to fly in three or four years time. It's four <coughs> passengers at the minute, the range about hundred miles. Yeah. When we develop our hydrogen fuel cell battery hybrid, it's gonna be 500 miles. You will take off from this building perhaps and you'll be in Paris and landing on a rooftop of the building you want to go to in 45 minutes. It's going to transform how we think about flying around cities and in between cities, and it will expand the, 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 the potential for urbanization in the 21st century. Well, I hope you're right. Are the regulators on board? 
Who on earth is going to regulate this? The CAA? Well, or? If you read the Financial Times, you'll see that uh, Stephen Hillier. <laughs> I, I do don't occasionally. That's not a recommendation, but it is. No, 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 please so, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> the, the chairman of the UK Flat CAA. Flattery will get you a free lunch at some point, yes, so yeah. Good. I thought lunch with you was very expensive. <laughs> I thought you were, the, you were the top prize in the auction, no? Well, yes, okay, but good. yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the chairman of the CAA has just announced this is a government priority for the UK. A, a advanced air mobility, electrification of air travel is a priority. It's a huge sector uh, employing tens of thousands of people in the UK. And the decarbonisation of air travel, whilst difficult, and, and there's a lot of work to do, it's happening. It's happening right now. Fantastic. Well, if you can start getting flying taxis between Cambridge and London, I'm all in. So Cambridge and Heathrow is one of our top routes, actually. They're Fantastic. one of the most difficult routes to travel on the ground and completely within our, within our reach in three or four years' time. Three or four years. Can you hurry it up? <laughs> you need to speak to the CAA about that one. So. <laughs> I certainly will. Well, listen, thank you very much indeed. That's terrific. And um, best of luck in everything, particularly those flying taxis. Thank, thank you. you.